We've been fighting a long time. We have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela. Hey, welcome everybody. Stay with Sense Fidelium. Coming at once again with Charles Coulomb, who's still stranded in Austria. Indeed he is, and it is terrible. If, but if he I, was in L.A., he might get his water shut off. Uh, he might get his water shut off, and he uh, would not possibly be able to go to Mass regularly. So uh, he could do all that here, and today it is so bad for me right now that I had to go to the Hotel Zacher's Cafe. Uh, and have an incredible brunch. And then I went to go see the Kaiserwurft and the uh, treasure chamber of the Hofburg gawked at the uh, Holy Roman Empire crown. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard, but we're, we're, bearing, we're bearing up. We're making good. <laughs> uh, it's, it's difficult here right now. Um, but we're managing. No, I mean, on, on, honestly, Austria is almost returned to normal. Uh, what is that? What does that mean? Uh, I don't well, know what I mean, normal you still, means. <laughs> you still have to wear the masks on the uh, on the uh, public transport, and you go through kind of this kabuki with them when you come into a building, and then you take them off, and then you put them back on when you leave, and take them off when you're outside. I mean, anyway, <laughs> other than that, you know the little the little show of uh, <laughs> dominance and submission. <laughs> uh, you know thing is the numbers uh, the corona numbers are way down here and the government you know whatever else you say they uh, they jumped on the thing very fast and we have nothing like the numbers we had in the early spring you know um to the degree that anybody really knows what any of those numbers meant anyway yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> i mean we you know I, I had a number of friends get sick of the virus back then Mm -hmm. uh, and one of them, Alexander Shugel, will probably be well known to some of your uh, some of your audience. And Alexander had a very hard time with the uh, COVID. He he did beat it finally. He he kicked it, but it was hard because even though he's very young, he's twenty three. He's also extremely tall. I mean, really tall, like seven foot. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that extremely tall people very often suffer from respiratory problems, and that, of course, is where it attacked it. Uh, because it attacks whatever your problems are. If you have any underlying issues, that's what it goes after. But at any rate, um, no, it's it's uh, Mayor Garcetti of Los Angeles, as you helpfully reminded me, <laughs> is going to turn off the water and power to uh, any place where there's a large party going on. Uh, I have visions, you know, of grandma's uh, iron lung being turned off because her family are partying downstairs, you know. <laughs> A bridge game is think, going on. I, yeah, I, I, I don't think I don't think anybody here has iron lungs anymore. But if they do, they're in a bad way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I asked I, Charles, uh, come on, not to talk. Uh, L.A. was just in the news, but to talk talk about the great old KFC, not the cooks of the kitchen, who my brother and I used to joke about saying. Or there was a great video done to recruit new members is back in the old days about the World War One, World War Two, what the Knights did for yeah. the Pope, for Rome, for just the war vets in general. I remember tweet, uh, texting back to my friend, dude, where's that group at? I want to join that group. <laughs> These men called Knights, as uh, the book uh, put it. Well, I'll tell you, first I've got to come clean. I am a fourth degree Knight of Columbus. And... I'm a third degree Knight of Peter Claver, which shows you they're, uh, you know, far more discriminating, you know, in terms of their taste <laughs> as who they'll take in. But no, seriously, I, um, I'm very proud uh, certainly to be a Knight of Peter Claver, and I was very proud to be a Knight of Columbus for a long time. Um, 
the Knights have a, uh, a very proud history. Uh, they were founded uh, by Father McGivney, soon to be beatified, uh, thankfully. Uh, they were founded by him in the 1880s when discrimination against Catholics was at an all-time high and when the social net was at an all-time low because industrialization and immigration had put us in this weird place where before in America there was kind of a, a tight-knit social fabric where if you were out of work or something like that, Everybody else, if they didn't look after you, at worst, it was the county poor farm. But the rise of industrial conditions, especially places like New Haven, Connecticut, where the order was founded, made that a thing of the past. But at the same time, uh, your value to the factory work, uh, owner was purely your ability to work. And if you couldn't work, you were out of a job. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the uh, Protestants had very strong fraternal organizations, the Freemasons come to mind, and the Sons of Pythias and the Odd Fellows. What a great name for a group, the Odd Fellows. <laughs> kind of um, like the greatest name for the political party ever made, the Know Nothings. Oh, the Know Nothings, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that was also a good one. I, uh, I'd join them today if they weren't anti-Catholic. I, mean, <laughs> I, I love that the whole truth and advertising piece. Yeah, I don't know anything. <laughs> What is, what is your party going to do to solve the current crisis of this? I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. like Oh, like the other parties have any idea. Right. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> we'll tell you we have no bloody idea. The other dead. <laughs> the, uh, unfortunately, that's not what it was about. No. <laughs> it, would, it would have been a tremendous. Uh, it would have been fantastic if it was. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Can you imagine that kind of honesty? No, well, for me, and maybe together we'll find a way out of this garbage. I don't know. <laughs> Let's just go down to the pub, have a beer, and we'll be all right. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll figure it out. I maybe not. Who knows? <laughs> so, and, and how do you how do you intend to deal with immigration? I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll figure, figure something It'll out. It'll solve maybe. itself. <laughs> what not. else you got? <laughs> Wait, well, the economy doesn't look too good. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> You don't say. It's really, it's, it's really too bad about all those people out of work. People, are, a lot of people are in jail. You're right. Yeah, that, that, that's that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you would find it that, that such a person would be hard to debate, though. <laughs> you know, they really would be. I I, I, I can see it now. Uh, so, don't you think we're falling behind in the uh, military race with Russia? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what those statistics mean? You know. What do you think about global warming? It's hot here and it's cold there. Uh, dress, dress appropriately. <laughs> I don't know. I, I prefer uh, the summer. I prefer going to the beach. Uh, you know, the winter, I tend to stay inside. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, that that would be that would be kind of kind of hard to argue with, really. And then probably the, the party would get into power and never get out. You know, people would be so relieved. And someone who understood it from their point of view, you know, <laughs> why do they think there's uh, why do they think there's so much uh, uh, difficulty in the economy? Well, I don't know. Who, nobody else does. <laughs> Listen, pal, economics is like voodoo, only with a, a lower uh, success rate. Hey, come on. You know, hey, should we end the Fed? Yes, done. Okay. <laughs> well, what are you going to do about interest interest uh, 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 interest levels? I don't know. <laughs> What does anybody do about him? What Who do is do he? About him? That's a weird name. I, a weird I, name for a guy. <laughs> I think there would probably there would be a lot of support. Oh know, yeah. <laughs> my my late father used to say that if the polls, if people answered the polls honestly, something like on the order of seventy uh, percent on any given question would be, I don't know, or I don't care. <laughs> but you know, leaving the thirty percent who have an opinion informed or otherwise, but. Uh, no, so anyway, uh, but as far as the Knights go, uh, Father McGivney came along and started a highly effective organization that did several things at once. It had the insurance element so that members could put money away uh, for their loved ones in case they died in industrial accidents, that kind of thing. It was very common. Uh, and it gave the widows and families something to rely on. The 
other thing it did, though, the fraternal aspect, was it built unity amongst Catholics, uh, amongst Catholic men. Mm -hmm. uh, it engaged them in the work of their local parishes and also in the work of the uh, order at the state level. It, it, it encouraged them to become active politically. Now, when I say active politically, I don't mean to say that uh, in, in party politics, uh, but in attempting to see the church teachings to some degree prevailed in a very non or anti Catholic environment. And that, you know, that's not a small thing. Mm. It very strongly fostered patriotism. Now, again, uh, American Catholic patriotism has always been kind of a paradoxical thing because basically, not unlike uh, ancient Rome or modern Japan or modern India, the Catholic is called upon to love his country even if his country hates his stinking guts. Well, of course, they do, they do now, but they did in the 1880s for the opposite reasons. Mm -hmm. Then we were foreigners and we were kind of wild drinkers and all that, kind of upset people, anti-prohibition and so forth. Now they hate us uh, because we're beautiful. No, they hate us because, um, you know, we're oppressive and evil and uh, uh, white civilization and blah, 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 blah. You know, there's always a reason, you know, two morons yapping at each other, the old anti-Catholicism and the new anti-Catholicism, just open mouths, a little bit of drool in the corner, because they don't know anything anyway. Well, uh, the Knights of Columbus undertook to fight anti-Catholicism within the country while promoting patriotism amongst Catholics. And that's kind of an interesting double-edged sword. Uh, in World War I and World War II, they did a huge amount of work toward helping veterans, and not just Catholic uh, veterans fighting. Uh, in, the, uh, in the First World War, they were very, very active in providing hospitality tents and that kind of thing. Everything free for American servicemen in France, the doughboys, as they were called. Uh, and they did their best to do similar stuff in the Second World War. And certainly there are a lot of uh, veterans, uh, uh, services for veterans that the KFC has always tried to apply, and also for youth. On the one hand, uh, early on, they developed what was called the Squires of Columbus mm -hmm. as a youth program. But at the same time, they often worked in tandem with the Boy Scouts, uh, especially with Catholic troops, and were sometimes helpful in uh, the Catholic Scouting Awards program, things like the Adultory Day and the Pope Pius XII, both of which I have, incidentally. Not that we're, uh, you know, patting myself on the head. So. That was the Knights of Columbus uh, prior to Vatican II. Now, after Vatican II, a phenomenon developed which led many uh, traditionalist-minded uh, Catholics to discount the Knights. And that was simply the fact that the order would not be involved in the trad fight. Now, to be honest with you, I never took that view. And I never took that view because I knew what the order was all about. The order would never go against the hierarchy, for good or for ill. Mm -hmm. And so you really could not expect more out of the knights than you could expect out of the hierarchy. We had a, a very famous case, for instance, uh, in California, in Southern California, back in 85 or 86. Uh, at that time, one of the most uh, pro-abortion candidates in Congress was Congressman Royball from California, you know, the King of Kennedy-style Catholicism in politics. Well, as it happened, uh, there was no election nearby, but there was a vacancy for the red hat normally occupied by the Archbishop of Los Angeles, today occupied by the Bishop of Indianapolis, but, you know, times change, I guess. <laughs> anyway, um, so that that hole was there in the in the college, and Archbishop Mahoney, as he was then, issues a rip roaring letter with no election in sight, except the need for someone to wear a red hat in LA, declaring that no Catholic could vote for a pro abortion candidate. And it was a fine, 
final letter, it's just there was no election in the Bible. But the Knights of Columbus, the state Knights of Columbus, um, took it upon themselves to try to expel Congressman Roy Ball from the order because of his incredibly pro voting stance. Cardinal Mahoney intervened personally to keep him in. And the order backed down because they will never do more than the hierarchy. Now, as long as you understand that and accepted them within what they did do, and they did a lot of things. It was the, old, the whole Keep Christ in Christmas program. Uh, they had all sorts of very fine materials that pointed out, that they put out there. In recent uh, years, about two years ago, they put out a really neat thing on manhood. Uh, written by Bishop Olmsted of Phoenix. There was a whole program to go along with it. It was really fine, really good stuff. You just can't expect more than what they're capable of doing. You know, it's like kind of like going to an Italian restaurant and wanting to know why they don't have chow mein. Well, it's because that's not what you go to an Italian restaurant for. Capiche? And you did not, you just don't. <laughs> You know, you don't go to the Knights of Columbus because you want the Tridentine Mass and you want the local bishop smacked around uh, because he hides pedos and he uh, loves altar checks. You know, that's not what you do with the KFC. But you did join the KFC if you wanted to get really more active and a nuts and bolts way with the faith, working with charities, working for uh, everything from the Special Olympics to returning vets. That's what you did. And within those restrictions, the order did a really great job. And, of course, there was also the color guard, mm -hmm. which were very unique. Uh, those wonderful chapeaus with plumes and all that. You had to be uh, fourth degree to get in the color guard. And whether it was a, a function of a bishop or a, uh, or a funeral or anything at all, the presence of the Knights always lent a certain air of distinction to any Catholic ceremony. However, I first began to wonder about the direction in which the current Supreme Knight was taking the order. And, and let me just say paradoxically, not paradoxically, parenthetically rather, maybe paradoxically too. Uh, if you ever get the chance to go to New Haven, and you're interested in the Knights, New Haven, Connecticut. There are three things to say. You want to see St. Mary's Church, where the daughter was born, mm -hmm. and where our blessed, soon-to-be blessed founder is entombed. You want to go to the Knights of Columbus Museum. If you get the chance, and you can, see if you can get a tour of the Supreme Headquarters, known in uh, Knights jargon as just as Supreme. I, uh, I have to admit, I, uh, uh, when I was taken on a tour there back in 2014, I uh, <laughs> kept on looking in crannies, you know, like this. And the then Supreme Warden who was taking me around said, uh, Brother Coulomb, are you looking for something? And I said, well, yeah, Diana Ross. It took him a second, but then he got it and started laughing, you know. Of course, whenever there's, an, there's a, uh, a vacancy on the Supreme Court, and people ask me who I think should go on, I always say Diana Ross. You know, I, anything having to do with Supreme, whether it be the Court of the Knights of Columbus, I support Diana Ross completely. Anyway, and I want to go on record saying that. Okay, <laughs> I support Diana Ross. It just it's the way it is. It's Anybody good. doesn't like it in your audience, I don't care. It's it's a good one to support. She's awesome. <laughs> of course she is, and I think she needs, especially now. She needs all the support we can give her. So, just... I, I just put throw that out there. there. Yeah. But the uh, the thing is that uh, one of the first things that they did, and it might have predated uh, Anderson, to be fair, but uh, a Supreme or current Supreme Knight, but I was not happy about the... These, the downplaying and slow dissolution of the Squires of Columbus. I was never a member, and I was never active with the Squires. Uh, I was a Boy Scout, I was an Eagle Scout, Catholic troops, and so forth, but never had anything to do with the Squires. But still, it just seemed wrong to me 
especially because uh, the Squires were a great program for kids who didn't have access to the Scouts. Uh, I, I, I didn't like that, but I had other things to do. Mm -hmm. So where I began to seriously question things was when uh, admission of the order uh, was dropped to take, admission of first degree, was dropped to taking a, um, uh, to watching a video. That really bothered me because, uh, although of course I can't tell you what happened. <laughs> secret. But, yeah, it's a secret. But, although not after this year. Yeah, true. But my, my uh, uh, first degree ceremony was extremely impressive. Mm -hmm. You know. And I was I was very, very happy with it. Um, but so that bothered me, because it does it, it it gave you your first degree ceremony and initiation, uh, the costumes, the ceremonies themselves, everything, really gave you a feeling for what the nights were all about, or should have been about, or would have been about, or whatever. So that bothered me. Then first came uh, the Supreme Knights announcement that they were getting rid of the traditional uniform. Mm -hmm. Now there was no consultation about this. This popped out of nowhere. Nobody asked any. Now he said there was consultation, but you know it's like every modern body now. They always say, "Well, you know, after after consultation with stakeholders, we stakeholders really. You, you, do you ever actually talk to anybody who anyone really knows? Well, no, they never did." So, I mean, it, it's, it's the way corporate America works. And it, it, it gave one very much the feeling that that's all they were interested in. Mm -hmm. but really, the insurance. More than anything else, is expanding insurance space and the fraternal secondary. So they came up with this so-called new uniform which looks exactly like the Royal Canadian Legion uniform. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not against the Royal Canadian Legion. They're wonderful men. They've served Queen and Country loyally. I'm all for them. You bet. But it, it, it stank a little bit close to uh, stolen glory, mm -hmm. you know. And on this day of the founding of the paper of the uh, Purple Heart, today's Purple Heart Day, just so you know, it, it, I don't know. The whole thing seems a little weird. Um, but that was bad enough. You know, they say, well, we're going to attract young people to the color guard. No, you're not. No, you're not. The fact is, the Knights of Columbus brand attracts who it's going to attract. The color guard attracts who it's going to attract. I was contemplating going into it because I had just made my fourth degree when this came down. And, oh, and of course, the, the other thing, too, I should mention with regard to the color guard, one of the most annoying things is the tendency amongst a number of bishops and priests uh, down to the years to be very upset at the knights drawing their swords at ceremonies oh that's just so warlike I, i'm just so upset oh gee wilkers well maybe if i wasn't such a little wuss things wouldn't be so <clears throat> anyway <laughs> you get the idea yes that really drove me crazy and the knights would go along with it which also bothered me well I'm happy to say, by the way, that the Knights of Peter Claver color guards are intact. Their uniform is very similar in cut, but different in color. Mm -hmm. And on those occasions, uh, and I'm happy to say we're able to do this in Los Angeles for the annual procession for the, uh, the Queen of the Angels. Uh, when you've got both the Knights of Columbus in the traditional uniform and the Knights of Peter Claver in their uniforms, it, it just, it was great. It's pretty cool, yeah. It, it was it was it was really it was really wonderful to see them, you know. And they would they would trade off every year as to which would be the, you know, in which position. And it was really neat. Anyway, so uh, that really bothered me. But even more than that was the nasty way in which it was imposed, the way in which knights who have worn have purchased at great expense and worn their uh, regalia proudly mm -hmm. were punished for refusing to give it up. 
See, the Knights of Columbus are, after all, a voluntary organization. You don't really punish people in a voluntary organization, because if you do, they'll just say to hell with you. Uh, does the phrase, let me kick you in the rear real hard, mean anything to you? <laughs> um, apparently not to spring. So that, all, that was all bad enough. But then the, the, uh, it, it got worse. Uh, after the, the nastiness regarding the regalia, uh, it was then announced that the first, second, and third degrees ceremonies would be merged. The secrecy would be taken away so you could bring your families and all that. And that kind of wrecks it. And you know, the argument that they make is, oh, well, we don't want to take people away from their families. Okay, sometimes guys want to be with other guys. And that's even true if they're married and have kids. Yes, it's true. Especially if the other guys are people they, whose company they enjoy and have similar interests. I know we're not supposed to enjoy men's clubs anymore. Because that's exclusive as don't you willikers? Oh! You know, what a bunch of, of candy-striped little, little, I don't know what to, what to say, we're, we've been turned into. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but it never works the other way, which is why there's still women's clubs. It's why there's still women's colleges. You know, one of my uh, one of my favorite things to do when people ask me where I went to university is either to say Mills College, which is a girls' school in, in Marin County, or I'll say Patrice Lumumba Friendship University in Moscow. You know that either one generally gets, uh -huh. <laughs> but nobody dares question it though. That's that's the great thing about today. You know, you can say something utterly stupid like that, and and uh, everyone's afraid to say anything. Yes. So, <laughs> how could you have gone to Bill's College? What do you mean? Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised they haven't pulled the movie The Jerk yet. You know, when Steve Martin starts out, "I was born a poor black child." Wait, how's that oh, still wait. on? <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> I, I would never say that. My my line is, "I was born at an early age." <laughs> I, I don't remember the experience, although people assure me it did happen. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, so that was bad enough. And now I think what our Supreme Knight is doing is remember, the Knights of Columbus are basically, uh, at the end of the day, there is no check on Supreme. The board chooses the members of Supreme, including the Supreme Knight. Uh, but the board members are appointed themselves and although the rank and file in the in the uh, local councils that you know are on the parish level primarily and the state level folk do a lot of things at the end of the day they'll have to do what uh, supreme tells them mm. and i my suspicion uh, well i'm going to make some predictions and i'm going to tell you everything i've said about the knights of columbus beginning uh, with, when they started getting rid of, you know, doing the initiations as videos, I made a series of predictions, and every one of them have come true, sadly. Um, and people go, oh, no, that'll never happen. Yeah, well. Um, I'm going to make another couple of predictions. One is that eventually the whole fraternal thing is going to be phased out, mm -hmm. and it'll be on all a purely insurance thing like uh, uh, the Foresters. You know, you've heard Foresters Financial. Mm -hmm. Well, they were the ancient order of Foresters. And they had they were a fraternal order, non-Catholic, but they, were, they weren't Masonic. But they were like the Elks. You know, and they had a whole bunch of things they did and so forth. Well, that's all, almost all gone. There were very, very few Forester local lodges, or whatever they call them. Uh, it's almost all an insurance thing now. And the other thing is that they will definitely circle K Columbus. Mm -hmm. And probably they'll allow women in so as to double the possible numbers of insurance people. 
Yeah. If the, so, if the order of Malta can do it, why not the KFC? Well, it, it will surely end up, I mean, they'll come up with a name like the Knights of Unity or something. Mm-hmm. And then eventually they'll get rid of uh, Knights, you know, just be called Unity or some stupid name. And that's the direction they're going because it's the most profitable. Mm-hmm. And this takes us back to something that we have seen with the Boy Scouts. It takes us to things we have seen with uh, many organizations in America where you get a top heavy uh, central headquarters that's like a big corporation uh, and whose interests therefore diverge from the interests of the local branches. It's more important to them to do whatever they're going to do to keep that big central organization funded than to carry on with the mission of the order or, or the scouts or whatever it happens to be. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a tendency we see all over and it um, you know the way they threatened the Boy Scouts was by threatening the central uh, Politburo there in Dallas and to save their money and save themselves they caved Mm. Yeah, I joined. Uh, I'm a third degree. Uh, I remember when I came back in, my brother told me, he goes, join the, join the Knights, join the Knights. That's your next step. And we were all jacked to do it, trying to stay awake during the meetings because they were they put somebody that said, if you have trouble sleeping, go to a meeting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, you know, part of the part of the problem, I think, with the with the Knights in that regard is that they were, in a sense, too democratic. Because... When you have all the members of a council are trying to sit in on a business meeting, business meetings are their nature dull things. Mm-hmm. Um, it's often seemed to me that that sort of business meeting should be restricted to the committee, you know, to the Grand Knight and his various officers. They should make the decisions and then maybe run them past the council membership to be voted on, but not this endless, endless palaver. Because it takes time away from charitable and social endeavors, which is what people join for. Yeah, yeah. They want to come here you know, and talk about the finances of the thing and the minutes of the thing. Want to talk to the guys that were there. That's what you joined the order for and uh, see what you could do to help out the community. Yeah, and, and of course, use the bar. Uh, <laughs> see, that was another thing, too, was when they started uh, discouraging bars mm-hmm. for local councils. We know we go back to the wussy stuff. The, the the American wuss is a terrible thing. I, I have very little use for it. And it's, you know, it's always sort of snide. Oh, oh gee, well, it's so awful. Why are you doing that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, shut up. Shut up. Why don't you go to somebody in some quiet room somewhere and be annoying all by yourself? Yes. Just stop it. Men are men. Women are women. Wusses are neither. <laughs> Stop it. I grant, I understand you don't have a gender, you're non-binary, you're just whiny and annoying. I understand. That's your thing. Go do it elsewhere. But unfortunately, wussery is almost triumphant mm. in most of the, the formerly male organizations. It's a contagious disease that won't go away. There's Yeah. Well, it's easier because it's the way the whole country has gone. Yeah. It's yeah. the way our leadership are. It's the way a lot of the church hierarchy are, mm-hmm. as witness the swords. You know, my Aunt Jenny, God rest her, she died in March. Uh, she, do you remember the priest who founded Covenant House? Yeah, I mean, I don't uh, know him, but yeah, I know, yeah. You know who he is. Yeah. I forget his name. Bruce Ryder, Richter, something. Ricker, I forget. Anyway, when he was outed, as a you know a pedophile uh, my aunt said oh i always thought he was he was one of those guys and i said what well she always thought he was you know alternative lifestyle mm-hmm. and i asked her why she thought that and how long she thought that. i said oh since he was a chaplain at uh, ritter bruce ritter he was uh, a chaplain at a uh, at a Catholic college in uh, the New York area. I forget which one now. And in 67 or 8, something like that, 
he forbade the ROTC for presenting arms at the elevation, which is standard when you've got military personnel mm -hmm. at, a, mm -hmm. at a mass. I mean, around the world. Mm -hmm. now, I, I had no idea. But she, that had annoyed her at the time. She never forgot it. And the, her immediate supposition was that the guy must be queer. Because who else would have a problem with that? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the, the, the sheer chutzpah, that because he didn't like it. He was going to oppose his view because he was in charge. Well, no, see, schmuck. You're not more important than hundreds of years of tradition. All you are, little man, is the creature who's warming the seat right now. And when you die, no one will remember you. <laughs> now, I hate to quote Stephen King, but uh, he, he does come up with some good ones. And in his otherwise kind of annoying gunslinger series, I say annoying because if you read the whole thing, and I read the whole thing, and I was enjoying it. I mean, there were parts I didn't care for, but by and large, it was an enjoyable read, but it was one big volume after another. The ending of the series was so annoying, I threw it across the room. I'm not going to tell you what it was, but it was just, I couldn't believe he would do that. I was really annoyed. Anyway, but in that parallel world that the gunslinger set in, one of the nastiest things that anyone can say to another is, you have forgotten the face of your father. I mean, that, it, it's, if someone says that, and you're, 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 you're basically being called the uber wuss. Yes. There's just nothing worse than that. So uh, with all this stuff that the Supreme Knight has been doing, it just, that phrase, and, and not just in the Knights, in the Scouts, in the Sierra Club, with John day. Muir, you know, you have forgotten the face of your father. I said it last time. I'll say it now. If you don't like your founder's work, if you don't like the basic orientation of an organization, get out. Do something of your own because you're so smart and so talented and you know so much. Pick up your little tuckus, cash in your chips, leave the organization, and then either start something in your own image that will be perfect and wonderful because it'll be like you, or go home and stare in the mirror and you know thank God you're not as other men. I remember, uh, I remember saying, what would Father McGivney do at quite a few meetings? And But I, I have to say that my, my uh, experience, well, I mean, that's why I went to the fourth degree. My experience with the Knights as, uh, on the local level mm -hmm. has generally been extremely pleasant. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about it. That was in a, you know, the I'm, GA. That was just the money part of it. The, the sales, you know, include me out. But uh, as far as the rest of it goes, I, uh, I mean... I'm a proud member of a council at this moment, although of course I'm here and not there. Um, I I uh, member member of a uh, of a uh, fourth degree assembly, I, and you know there's even the the there's a certain charm even about the kind of not old fashioned is the word I want, but kind of the. Well, I, the, the word I want, uh, it's almost Norman Rockwellish, almost stereotypical, you know, a uh, little out of touch, but not, not in a bad way. Yeah. Because, you know, you, you go in for that. One of the allures of the Knights of Columbus, I think, uh, for Catholic men, is the, the idea that it's still a place where more or less men are men. And where you don't have to worry about having to be a wuss, you know. But fortunately, that's being taken from us, like so much. There were some solid guys back in there. I think, like I told you last time, the uh, the nice Columbus Zone Yankee Stadium. There was quite a few Yankees that were uh, nice boxers or nights. Uh, there was like oh. a who's who of great, you know, people in the United States that were nice politicians, actors, etc. Oh yeah, the nice the nice of Columbus. They really, you know, I'll tell you something funny. Back in 1992, I went to uh, Nassau in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. 
And now one of the odd things about the Knights of Columbus, of course, is that it's not just the United States, which I'm really so curious about what the fourth degree ceremony is like for Canada. Because, you know, it's the patriotic degree and it's very patriotic. I won't say more than that. Although I'm sure it's going to be open, you know, like tomorrow uh, to non-Catholics and, you know. But I am so curious. And if anybody out here knows, communicate with me privately. I am so, because, you know, fourth degree can talk to other fourth degree about it. I am so curious as to what the Canadian and other foreign uh, uh, members are. You know, we, we have Mexican martyrs in the Cristero Wars that were Knights of Columbus. And that, that by itself is something to be very, very proud of. Uh, you know, and, and again, if, if anybody wants to turn their noses up at the Mexicans, they should meditate on that. Mm -hmm. You know, similarly, my brethren and Peter Claver, you know, if you want to turn your nose up at the blacks, look into the Knights of Peter Claver, look into the six black saints that uh, our country's black Catholic population has produced, and then shut your gourd. Yeah, they were very instrumental in getting guys out of Mexico to protect them up here, and that's why there was a big uh, KKK rally in D.C. because all that was happening, and they were marching on D.C. to stop the Knights, basically, from bringing refugees in yeah and then and you know again it's it's very proud just a pity that as in so many institutions we do not have a leadership that was formed for whatever reason that was formed in the real traditions of the order i don't know what happened nobody asked me i wasn't around but somehow as with the scouts you know if you don't like Baden Powell's vision for boys, don't go to the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Save yourself time. You know, become a a rainbow girl or something. I don't know, but stay out of the Scouts. If if you don't like the American Legion, you know, you don't like the whole veterans thing. Great. Don't join the Legion. Don't join the Elks. Don't join the Sierra Club. Don't join anything if you don't like the organization as it was founded. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. Go away. I, 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 I will repeat this until I'm blue in the face. You're already blue. <laughs> Where am I blue? Anyway, but that's, that's my sermon on the nights. I mean, I, I hope that something can be done to stop this direction that the order is going in and to reverse the damage that's been done. Make the Knights great again. Yeah, indeed. But unfortunately, like the country, I, I think the Knights' decline is symptomatic of a greater rot that, in a sense, sim can't simply be solved within in-house. I, I, you know, you, you look the widespread failure of leadership across the country in terms of dealing with the rioting and so on. I mean, leave aside the other things. It speaks to a deep systemic illness in our society mm. that will not be fixed by the usual cures, won't be fixed even by voting. Mm. I mean, it's good to vote these morons out. I'm not saying it wouldn't be. But similarly, where did, where did we get a supreme... Uh, Council of the Knights of Columbus that would be like this? How could they be in this position? Those are the questions that have to, have to be asked. Same with the scouts. You know, what? Why are we being run by such men? Where do they come from? Where was the failure of vision? I remember getting the the uh, being given the book by a council, a parish priest, the book on Father McGivney. And uh, the next week, I tell them how great it was, and they were like, "Oh, you read that?" What? <laughs> They don't even know who the guy is. <laughs> no, they don't. And, you know, I, I read one biography of him. Now, Father McGivney was very devoted to Our Lady and to the Sacred Heart mm. and the Blessed Sacrament. Strangely, him being a priest, he had some interest in the Eucharist. But I remember reading a short KFC bio of him that basically dismissed his devotional life as, you know, oh, it was, it was uh, normal for the time or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, normal for the time, you moron. 
that's like saying, yeah, that whole eating thing. Yeah. Because that's what people did in those days. You know, they were like eating and stuff. But, you know, we we're, Something we're wrong so much with smarter. Them. We're so much smarter than they were. We're so brainy. Uh, no, I, 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 anyway, I don't want to be too much of a Debbie Downer. But we are definitely in a sort of bonfire of the vanities mode right now. Where all the weaknesses of all of our institutions in church and state are being shown up. Because what, what the twin crises of COVID on the one hand and the civil unrest on the other has done is simply pulled the veil away. It's shown the emperor's new clothes for what they are, nothing. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, why is it this way? Why do we have this uh, wholesale systemic failure in virtually every walk of life? Why is this? Well. A believing Catholic knows that the reason is, at the end of the day, that the church, Catholics, are the salt of the earth, and we've lost our savor. We no longer believe in the salvation of souls. We are, as Benedict XVI put it, functional universalists. Uh -huh. Well, when you do that, the church rots. And when the church rots, not just Catholic institutions, but everything rots. All of society. Yeah, because where Vatican II had one thing very correct was when it, it made the statement, the church is the soul of the world. Now, there are a lot of senses in which that's not true. You know, you're talking about the prince of this world and things like that. That's using the world in a different sense. But the world in the sense of human institutions taken as a whole, that's very true. Mm -hmm. When the church is sick, everything is the sick. The arts sick. suffer. Uh, industry suffers. Agriculture suffers. Everything suffers because people are being malformed. And whenever people are malformed, everything they do turns to garbage. So, how do we get past this? Well, the first and most obvious thing is you study your Catholic faith and you try to practice it wherever you are, however you are. You try to evangelize. You do the spiritual and temporal works of mercy. You do all that stuff that never changes from one moment to the next. That's the first thing. But then the second thing is look at the organizations you belong to. You have to ask yourself two questions. Firstly, are you in a position to make any real difference with it? And that may or may not be true, even if the national leadership is awful. That's something you have to figure out on your own, I'm afraid. The second is if you agree with the vision of the founder, whoever the founder was, whatever that original vision was, then rededicate yourself to it and try to get everyone you know in the organization to do likewise. If you can't do that for whatever reason, and leave. Don't stay. I am contemplating my uh, Knights of Columbus membership as we speak. And I won't lie to you, you know, for a fourth degree man to leave the order is not that common. And it's, it's painful. It's very painful. But do I want to devote any time or money at all to something that's not going to end up well? And maybe I do. I mean, maybe may, I haven't made up my mind. Maybe it's worth fighting. Or maybe what my council are doing, what my assembly are doing, is so worthwhile that it's worth sticking around to support it. That's also a possibility. But that, those are choices I have to make. And they're choices that every member of every organization has to make. In a sense, you're talking about localism at the KFC level. Pretty much. And at, at every level. Well, yeah, every because level, but... One one thing we have come to realize, I think, is that the higher up, whether it be church, state, or what what uh, our UN friends would call uh, civil society, meaning non-government uh, players, NGOs, uh, is that the further you go up the ladder, the more rotten they are. Mm -hmm. 
And that's just the nature of life we live now. The way we live now. The new normal. The new normal. The new normal. Yeah, which as I say, the new normal is the old stupid. But on Planet uh, Clown, as one guy, yeah, yeah. Englishman said. Yeah, well, or, or another. I mean, years ago, I, I had kind of a funny revelation. Um, it was after Mass, a Tridentine Mass, and a friend of mine and I, who's, and the friend has in lived in the Pasadena area since he was born, and he's seven years older than I am. He's my brother's age. So I said to him, Bill, if you and I were standing, we just come from Mass, if you and I were standing on this street corner, and say 1963, what would it have looked like? Because it's an area that hasn't changed, you know. And he said, well, the girls and the ladies would be all be in dresses and hats. And, and the guys would be all dressed like you and me, you know, T-shirts, jeans, and so on. The little ones would be dressed that way. And that was what suddenly hit me. There aren't any more grown-ups. No, yeah. They're all gone. It's nursery world. Everybody a little one forever. Yeah. Even the ones at the top. They're like big little kids who are running the show. And they they do what they want because see, little ones do that. Little ones do what they want to do. And they don't care because they don't have to. They're little. Yeah, some, so, some celebrities getting beat up for saying there are too many adult boys in the world right now. Well, there, and it's it's very true, and it's all and it works also, you know, in other areas we wouldn't expect it. Uh, some years ago, it hit me in this nursery world we live in, and this is a, a random thought. But you know, Hollywood stars aren't glamorous anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason they're not glamorous is simply because glamour. Is an adult thing. It's not a little kid thing. It's not a teenager thing. Uh, later teenagers, you know, 18, 19, 20, can be very attractive, but they can't be glamorous. I, I like our mutual friend, uh, Mike Church's uh, quote, uh, obedience to the unenforceable. You yeah. don't. No one's enforcing you to dress nice, glamorous, no. but you do it. Well, you do it if you've got any sense of self mm -hmm. or of what you're doing. If, if what you're doing is important to you, you dress appropriately. I mean, I've often thought, and you know, we know, we all know horror stories of uh, men and women being thrown out of trad churches because they were badly dressed. Uh, and I think that's, you know, you really don't want to do that. But in thinking about how I would address the problem if I were a priest, um, I would probably say, ladies and gentlemen, how would you dress if you were going somewhere important? You know, see an employer about a job, uh, maybe meet the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. Say, so, you know, something you considered important. How would you dress? Just kind of, you know, t-shirt and jeans come sliding in. Probably not. So the way you dress for mass, and this is the way I would put it, I wouldn't single people out and point at them. I would say, look at the way you dress for mass as being an indicator of how important you think mass is. If it's not important, fine, be casual. You know, that... And if you, but if you're gonna say, well, God loves me just as I am, so I don't have to make any effort. Well, good. Try that with your employer. Yeah, yeah. You know, do that at work. See what happens. Now, I've uh, seen more people get better dressed because they just see everybody else doing it, and it just oh, gets yeah. them. It, it, it didn't well, take it, anybody to bash them in the head. They just no. They just hey, these guys are doing this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start dressing like these guys. Yeah, the opposite works too. Mm -hmm. You know, if you just slag around. Uh, and you're surrounded by people who are just slagging around. That's what you're going to do. So, God bless you. It's been a lot of fun. And remember, if you're feeling crazy, you probably are. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>